Dzień dobry Państwu. Good morning. We are about to start our discussion. I'd like to welcome you warmly to our debate on Russia and its relations with uh, uh, with the far right in Europe and uh, in the world. On behalf of myself and on behalf of Heinrich Böll Foundation and other co-organizers of today's event, my name is Grzegorz Rzeczkowski. I'm an investigative uh, journalist of Politica. I'm uh, uh, author of uh, a book on the eavesdropping scandal. And before I move on to introduce our great panelists, I'd like to tell you that I'm really pleased that so many of you have come today to, to our discussion. Thank you so much. The previous debate was on China and, well, well, China is uh, interesting, and when it comes to Russia, well, a bit less interesting, but it seems that uh, these words are not true, because there are so many of you that it seems Russia uh, is interesting. Please join us if you're interested. Uh, there are some free seats. Uh, on the floor, unfortunately, but still. OK. I've got some notes prepared. Uh, our panelists, our guests today are Katarzyna Chimiak. Katarzyna Chimiak is a historian, translator, and social activist, one of the founders and member of the board of the Warsaw-based For Free Russia Association which aims to promote dialogue between civil society in Russia and Poland. Katarzyna Chimiak is a historian by education, as I've mentioned. He, she also studied international relations at the Warsaw School of Economics. Uh, she works in the migration program of the Institute of Public Affairs. Klementyna Suhanov writer, author of a great book uh, entitled Ja Gombrowicz, Mi Gombrowicz, uh, two volumes, uh, lots of pages, but it's all, it's all the time worthy to read about Gombrowicz. So in the perspective of our relations with Russia and the perspective of our relations with the radical nationalist uh, uh, right-wing, uh, groups, it's important that we have you here. Clementina is also an author of uh, articles published, uh, for instance, in uh, Gazeta Wyborcza. She's uh, an activist, uh, feminist activist, and she's also. And we also have a guest from Ukraine, Taras Kuzio. Taras Kuzio is a professor in the Department of Political Science at the National University of. Kiev Mohilak Academy. She's al he's also a lecturer at the Foreign Policy Institute School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, in Maryland, in the USA. We are all very much interested uh, in the question that I'm going to uh, to ask uh, to Mr. Kozio. Before our debate, you sent us a very interesting graph, a very interesting graph. And that's because this graph shows who or which countries, which organizations are the main target of the Russian campaign disinformation campaign and propaganda campaign. Well, it's not a surprise if I say that number one is by far Ukraine 
and then we've got the United States, European Union, NATO, and so on and so forth, and the West in general. And it might be disappointing to you, but let me tell you, Poland is not mentioned in the list, which does not necessarily mean that the Russian propaganda uh, does not mention Poland. But I'd like to ask Professor about the following thing. Well, our panel is on the relations between Russia, Kremlin, and uh, far right, radical right, or maybe I should rather say uh, right movements. And I'd like to ask you what the situation looks like with this respect in Ukraine, because we treat Ukraine as the target of attacks of Russian propaganda. Lots of accusations uh, about uh, f um, the country being uh, subject to fascism, uh, fascist processes, and the Kremlin and uh, its supporters say uh, that uh, the country is being taken over by fascists. And it's interesting for me to learn in what way Russia has an impact on Ukraine through uh, right-wing ideology. And uh, are my theses right? answer the question. Ukraine has in Europe probably the lowest support for the far right of any country. Uh, they, even with the war with Russia, they cannot get into parliament. So uh, it's, the, it's ironic that this image exists. But also more importantly, um, the most extreme nationalists are, are not Western Ukrainian, which everybody assumes. Mm -hmm. They are Eastern Ukrainian and they are Russian speaking. Uh, the closest ideologically to a kind of a neo-Nazi ideology, skinhead, white supremacist, are um, national corps, and their members are linked to the Azov battalion, Azov regiment, and they are Eastern Ukrainian Russian speakers. Because um, war and conflict breeds extremism. Um, you don't have to be an extremist in Western Ukraine because you've won the war. <laughs> it's Ukrainian speaking. Um, there's no conflict there. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been no conflict with Poland since 1947. Mm -hmm. So it's finished mm -hmm. a long time ago. Whereas there is a war in Eastern Ukraine and the Russian speakers are the biggest um, uh, sufferers of the war. Russian speakers. Uh, the largest um, number of refugees are Russian speakers. The largest number of casualties of soldiers are Russian speakers. So no wonder this is the area which where you have greater extremism, as it were. So that's one of the ironies of, uh, of this. So, but let me kind of um, try to put this topic in a broader context, because it's really Russia, Ukraine, EU, or, or, and the West, shall we say. Um, and um, it's not a new thing that Russia or the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union always wanted to undermine NATO and EU, that's obvious. So what Putin is doing is nothing new in this, in this sense. But what, what it's new is that from 2010 onwards, we have the Eastern Partnership. And so Russia uh, and Putin, they begin to be not only anti-NATO, but also anti-EU. This is also at the same time of the mass protests in Russia and Putin's re-election in 2012, where he becomes even more nationalistic. He turns to the right even more. Um, and so there's greater support for the far right in Europe from then with his conservative values and such like. So this period of 2010, 2012, he thinks he has Yanukovych. He has pressure on Yanukovych to shift away from Europe to Eurasia. Um, but for the second time, this is important, he's insulted. Um, and he loses Yanukovych like he lost him in the Orange Revolution. And, and that's why he's a very angry man and invades Crimea. Um, so Putin should go to anger management classes. He's a very, <laughs> very, very angry. But what is, what is it that he, and you know, Putin um, uh, very much was hoping that Trump would win, not only because he hated Hillary Clinton, because there was a personal 
question there because Hillary Clinton supported the protests in Moscow. Um, but, but because he thought that with Trump, with his rhetoric in 2015, 2016, particularly because Paul Manafort was his campaign chairman and he was previously for 10 years working with Russian intelligence and with the party of regions in Ukraine. He's now in jail, where he should be. Um, the, um, uh, but Trump was giving the impression to Putin that there would be a second Yalta. That the US and Russia would agree to divide up the world, as it were. This is what, this is what Russia wants. It wants respect. It believes that since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the West is not respected anymore. So he wants to be treated as an equal by the U.S. and for the U.S. to recognize the former Soviet Union as Russia's exclusive sphere of influence, which means no EU, no NATO, and Finlandized countries like Ukraine. Um, the core of this new Eurasian Union is the Russian world, Ruski Mir, which is, which is like a kind of a contemporary Kiev Rus. Um, and of course, the most, in, besides Russia, of course, but one, you can't really have a Russian world without Kiev. And if Kiev is going west, then Russia has a problem. Um, and so, hence the the infatuation with Ukraine. It's it's, you know, where else in the world do you have a country calling an emergency meeting of the Security Council, because another country gets autocephaly for its church. That's Russia because of Ukraine. And this is like crazy. Um, so, uh, but Putin is very angry because, um, because he loses Ukraine a second time. Um, a Russian political technologist described Putin losing Ukraine in the Orange Revolution as Putin's personal 9-11. And this was his second 9-11. So he said, right, I will... Ya vam pokazhu. And that was the Crimea. Um, the West here was at fault because when Russia invaded Georgia in 2008, there were no sanctions. Russia got away with it. Putin thought it would get away with it again. He was mistaken. And this goes back to the question that Putin and Russian leaders don't understand the West. We saw that with Skripal as well in Britain. And they don't understand Ukraine. There are more experts in Warsaw on Ukraine than there are in Moscow or in Brussels, or in Washington, or in London. So this, um, this uh, uh, hope in, in Trump was a hope to get this new Yalta, that Ukraine would finally be, be given its rightful place in the Russian world. Because this is what, um, what, what... And the new current crisis with the impeachment process is directly related to this. Um, because pro-Russian forces in Ukraine, which are now very weak, um, including Mr. Firtash, who's been fighting in Vienna against his deportation to the U.S. to be put on trial, um, were in, have been involved in this whole scandal with Giuliani and all these. Um, in fact, Firtash paid, paid Giuliani and his <coughs> two cronies from, from Florida, uh, who are now also in prison, and um, to try and turn this whole Trump conspiracy mania against the idea that it was Russia intervened in 2016, but Ukraine intervened. And the power of this kind of disinformation is seen to the extent that the Republican Party, which was always the party the most anti-Soviet, the most anti-Russian, is now kind of siding with Russian propaganda, Russian disinformation. Um, How it happened? Um, well, I think it's, it's you know, with populist, every, populist nationalists everywhere, um, they believe in conspiracies, conspiracy theories. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a general pattern of populists everywhere. And um, they also played on Trump's narcissism. Um, and, um, and I think there's obviously money involved here. Um, maybe the fear amongst Republicans that they will lose the election without Trump because Trump, Trump can say or do anything and his 40% support never goes down. Which is again... It's, very typical for populists, uh, they, because they divide the population into people who hate them and people who love them. Bardzo ładnie pan nakreślił tu sytuację dotyczącą. Describe this situation in a very accurate way. 
as regards the current relations between Russia and, and the US and, and, and Ukraine and the US and the fundament of those relations. But I have one more question. What is Russia doing in Ukraine and how does that affect the Russian public opinion and how does it affect the image of Ukraine and Russia uh, in the world? Because Russia is always saying that there are so many Bandera supporters in Ukraine, which is, which is actually fiction. Because it doesn't understand, the, you can't understand a country if you have stereotypes and myths about the country. Russian nationalists, including Putin's view of Ukraine, is that it's divided into four sections. Crimea, Ethanash, of course. Then you have New Russia, which is populated by Russians, Ruski. By Ruski here, it means Eastern Slavs. They're all the same. They're all Ruski. And then you have Little Russia, which is Central Ukraine. And then you have these crazy fascists in Western Ukraine. They're not an ethnic group. They're just fascists. Because they were badly influenced by Poland and Europe. And so we don't want those. They're not really for us. But they came to power in the Euromaidan in this illegal putsch. They took over Ukraine with the help of Jewish oligarchs, because there's anti-Semitism here. It's called anti-Zionism, but anti-Zionism under communism was just camouflage anti-Semitism. So Jewish oligarchs, Western Ukrainian fascists, and CIA and the West. This is, this is the conspiracy against Russia. These fascists are in power in Kiev. They are preventing Ruski and little Russians from joining the Russian world, which they really want to, of course. Um, now, of course, this is ridiculous. I was two, two weeks ago giving a presentation in Dnipro, in eastern Ukraine. Dnipro has the highest rate of casualties of Ukrainian soldiers in Ukraine, three times more than any other region. Um, there were many Russian speakers there who were soldiers who had been to fight. It's the only place in Ukraine where you have a museum to the war. It's also a big Jewish center. It has the largest menorah in Europe, Dnipropetrovsk. Um, and many of those Jewish Ukraine oligarchs funded some of these even right-wing battalions. Um, so the idea that, um, you know, the, concept, the very concept of a patriotic Russian-speaking Ukrainian is something that is impossible to understand in Moscow. Simply impossible. But if you don't understand that, then you don't understand Ukraine. Because the uh, majority of Ukrainians did not support Putin in 2014. If they did, today Ukraine would not exist. Uh, it would be in a terrible crisis. So this schizophrenia means you have brothers in Ukraine, you know, in this old Soviet sense of brothers, Bratsko Narodu, uh, who are the little Russians and the Ruski who want to be in the Russian world. And then you have the fascists who are preventing them. This is now even more ridiculous because you have a Jewish-Ukrainian president. So you have a Jewish-Ukrainian president ruling a fascist Ukraine. <laughs> um, and not even, even funnier, in the summer of this year, Ukraine was the only country outside Israel with a Jewish-Ukrainian prime minister and a Jewish-Ukrainian president, but in a fascist Ukraine. So, uh, Russia, so Russia is fixated um, with it. Um, the amount of... One third is estimated by sort of a great, very good publication I could recommend for free, published by the European Union, called Disinformation Review. You can get it every week. They estimate that one third of Russian TV is devoted to Ukraine. One third. And 90% of that is negative, presumably on the fascists and then 10% on the brothers. Um, so you have this schizophrenic view. Um, and, of course, the, the approach to uh, describing Ukraine as a fascist rural country builds on Soviet ideological positions. You know, in, in the Soviet Union, it was bourgeois nationalists and neo-Nazi diaspora. Um, so this is what Putin is building on. Um, now, this, in turn, is a product of Putin's socialization. Because when he grew up, when he went to school, when he became a KGB officer, um, communism was dying already. So the Soviet Union made the Great Patriotic War the alternative new religion. And that's what Putin's done. They had a, a revival of the cult of Stalin and a revival of the 
of the Great Patriotic War. That happened under Brezhnev, under, under Putin, and now he's done the same in contemporary Russia. And if you have the Great Patriotic War as the new ideology, Stalin as the new cult, then of course it's pretty disgusting because then you have to uh, play down or ignore or belittle Stalin's crimes, which is what's happening in Russia. Uh, so the exact opposite of Ukraine, where Stalin is a, a monster in the public opinion. So um, this is also linked to Putin. This is where it becomes, you either think Putin is schizophrenic or this is like some weird postmodern approach to information on the news. Um, because Putin's favorite author is um, a white guardist, white emigre, uh, fascist and anti-Semite called Ivan Ilyin who also believed Ukrainians don't exist. Um, so, so at the same time as accusing Ukraine of being this kind of fascist country, um, what you have here is this kind of, you know, you have this approach to Ukraine like this, and then you have this approach to Europe um, where the, you are supporting the far right and to some degree the, the far left, because they are both, as we know from Britain, I'm br actually British, not Ukraine, um, maybe I shouldn't be saying that, but um, because we have Brexit in the months. Um, but um, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, leader of the Labour Party, is, anti is also Brexit for, for Brexit. So Putin is supporting this, and but the main reason he's supporting in both cases is anti-European, anti-EU position. And where this is a degradation under Putin is because even in the Soviet Union, Ukraine was treated better than it is today in contemporary Russia. The Soviet Union did not deny Ukraine's exist. It said they are very close to Russians, they are brothers, they will always be together, but they accepted they were a separate people. And Ukraine had a seat at the United Nations for, for, from 1945 onwards, separate to the USSR seat. But today you have a return to Tsarist and white guardist um, views of Ukraine. Ukraines do not exist. So Ukraine and Ukraines are fake news in this Russian media onslaught. Um, what this is, going back to your question about opinion polls, what this has meant is that Ukraine and Russia have gone in completely separate directions. Because today, 57% of Russians have a negative view of Ukraine because of Russian in disinformation, TV. It's the same number as the negative view of Americans. And um, if you look at it from the other side in Ukraine, now two-thirds of Ukrainians no longer see Russians as brothers. Um, why, why has that gone up? Well, because of Russian speakers. Have, basically, the view of West Ukrainians has now been grown to include Eastern Ukrainians. Because, um, you know, my father is from Western Ukraine. They never believed Russians were brothers. But now the, most Ukrainians do not. Now, now nearly three quarters of Ukrainians believe Ukraine and Russia are at war. Um, whereas the Russian official position is Crimea is not negotiable, it's ours, and we are not present in Donbass. This is a civil war. Well, if, if, you, think it's a, then if you think it's a civil war, you don't understand what's going on. Um, because uh, Russia has created an army of 35,000 soldiers with modern military technology. Um, and so th this technology did not come from somewhere. It came only from Russia. Um, but the themes... The themes of this um, are there's no Ukrainian language, there's no Ukrainian state, it's artificial, Crimea was always Russian, uh, Russian speakers are repressed in Ukraine, it's a civil war, fascists rule Ukraine, Ukraine is a puppet of the West, so Ukraine only exists because the West is financing it, it's, it only exists. So, and, and of course the most important thing, there's a Western conspiracy to divide the Russian people, by Russian people he means Eastern Slavs, Putin. And um, the West is denying what Russia should rightfully have, which is a, a kind of a 19th century style sphere of influence throughout the former USSR. That's what Russia does. Russia sees that as a source of its great power status, without and especially controlling Ukraine. Because of, you know, you have uh, two, three years ago in Moscow, Putin put up a monument to Vol Volodymyr Veliky, Volodymyr the Great one of the major rulers of Kiev Rus. When he ruled Kiev Rus, Moscow did not exist. So what's he doing in Moscow? 
Um, but, but it's this infatuation with the idea that we're all one people, um, as it were. So I, I think this is the... Just, I'll just conclude mm-hmm. and then we finish. Um, so I think this anti-EU position is not new. The Soviet Union did it, but it, Putin and Russian leaders became anti-EU after 2010 with the, with the creation of the Eastern Partnership. Then the rhetoric became as hostile as it was against NATO. In Brussels, they did not understand that. That's why there was a shock to them, the crisis of 2014. But basically what this was, was a competition between Russia and the EU over these territories like Ukraine. Um, and um, the, the crisis of 2014 was this product of this, this, this clash over, you know, can a country which is sovereign like Ukraine decide its own destiny. EU says yes, Moscow says no, because Eta Nash. This is Ruski territory. Um, and, you know, let me just quickly add towards the end, this is not just a position of a few people in Moscow. This is a position of the majority of Russians, including many members of the opposition. Alexei Navalny believes Ukrainians and Russians are a din rod, one people. Alexei Navalny thinks the Crimea is Russian. Um, most 85% of Russians support the annexation of Crimea. Only 10% do not. So put this kind of viewpoint has broader, broader views um, than simply just Putin. If Putin left tomorrow, if he, you know, w- without his shirt on, fell off a horse, or he's riding away, or, fight, or he died fighting a tiger in Siberia, then, um, then I don't think Russia's position would change very much. Uh, because for Russian nationalism, Ukraine is something central to their identity. That's the way they've made it. They can't see a Russian identity without Ukraine. And for that, linked to the question of great power status, that requires Ukraine's fin- Finlandization, no EU and NATO inside the former USSR. Um, so this is why all of these things are interlinked. Russia's <coughs> approach to Europe support for the far right, supports attempts to undermine uh, the EU and NATO, and its attempts to do the same in places like Ukraine and Georgia. Thank you. Pan profesor nam tu brawurowo wręcz, tak poprosimy o brawo, zarysował obraz sytuacji. Rzeczywiście słucha się tego z otwartymi niemalże ustami. Jak rozumiem, i to nie jest dla osób, które zajmują się, interesują się tym, co się dzieje w Rosji, nic szczególnie szokującego, ale warte podkreślić. Well, this is not shocking. Uh, this is not shocking for those of you who deal with uh, Russia on everyday basis, but the propaganda message coming from Russia uh, does not get into Ukraine because Ukraine is not the target of this mes- message, but uh, the target of this message is uh, Russian citizens and uh, foreign countries. Uh, they are the targets of uh, this uh, of these lies it is the european union the west and uh, uh, united states and now i'd like to ask a question to ms himiak you started to talk about the reception of this message by russian citizens uh, especially those who have some hope in the future authorities, elites, who probably will try to rebuild the country in the future. Is it really so? Like Professor said, you gave the example of Alexei Navalny, the protectionist views towards Ukraine are coming into play. Or is the situation different? So what does the situation look like where there is a popular meme in Russia, where Russia is looked at uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, Russian propaganda TV? It is a small country uh, with uh, borders uh, bordering Ukraine. 
uh, from all sides. That's the message coming from uh, public TV since 2014, uh, which is shocking. International topics, international agenda, well, uh, there Ukraine is dominating uh, and has been dominating for the past five years. And uh, as you said, the message is that in Ukraine, um, Ukraine illegally with uh, violence, a neo-Nazi junta took over uh, power and if there are any attempts uh, of uh, um, opposing uh, this violence, because officially no one speaks about war, but any attempts of uh, supporting uh, the anti-government forces concerning the current government in Ukraine, these attempts are new forms of uh, uh, of uh, fight against uh, fascism, which can be compared uh, to uh, to the Great War, and these parallels uh, are reiterated uh, in. Uh, Kremlin media from the very beginning, and I would like to emphasize the fact that, well, the fact that uh, Ukraine agenda dominates uh, in uh, public uh, media, this is linked to two aspects. First of all, what is on stake here is that Ukraine potentially can be a role model for the Russian society. There is a fear. Uh, of Kremlin elites that this would be the case and this fear uh, has been uh, has emerged after the first Maidan and well when uh, Russian people are showed the example of Germany uh, of uh, Scandinavian countries this seems very distant uh, to to people in Russia the standard of living in uh, Scandinavia seems something unattainable in Russia in the foreseeable future but when it comes to Ukraine well Ukraine is close when it uh, in uh, in terms of culture uh, in terms of language uh, this country seems close so if such a country can be sovereign, can be independent, can have welfare, this shows to the Russian citizens, uh, this is a proof to the Russian citizens that this could be possible in Russia as well. Obviously, the events in, uh, in Georgia were significant as well because this drew attention of uh, oppositions, uh, Saakashvili, corruption, and so on and so forth. But uh, Georgia is a small, relatively small country, and Ukraine is bigger and can be a good role model. And everyone realizes that, and that's why Russia is trying to depict uh, Ukraine in bleak colors. And this is also an attempt to the fact that Ukraine is being talked about uh, very negatively, is an attempt to, to, to draw at the attention of Russians away from all the negative aspects regarding the social sphere, all the problems linked to economic uh, issues, uh, reform of uh, the uh, pension system. There are lots of problems going on at local level and at national level that are really frustrating to people. And uh, talking about Ukraine is a way to distract uh, the attention of Russia. Uh, and now I'd like to, to tell you that it's not easy to depict the situation because some uh, part of opposition, including Navalny, well, in their message, which is addressed at Russia, they avoid uh, talking about Ukraine just because it is so much dominating in public media, in mainstream media. And if I understand it correctly, this means that they want to, uh, uh, to bring to the surface national problems uh, which are covered by international topics. And they want to build on those uh, domestic problems new majority. They want to gather people around uh, national problems. Uh, across uh, various traditional divides. So they want to show it's not true that the majority of Russians uh, support uh, Putin's politics when it comes to internal affairs. And in this way, they, they would like to create a majority that would be eager uh, to, to, to tackle the regime. Um, 
Moreover, some of oppositionists in Russia, they look at Ukraine uh, with great sympathy. It's not a coincidence that the new wave of Russian uh, uh, political emigration, uh, which was uh, uh, going not only in the direction of the West, uh, but in general, people were fleeing Russia, and lots of them came to Ukraine. And the thing was not only about similar or the same language, which made it possible for those people to find employment, but it was about sentiment as well. Some people who fled Russia after uh, 2014, they went to Ukraine, and they are activists uh, who supported the um, uh, revolution in U Ukraine, and they went to Ukraine, to, and they expected they would be treated as uh, Mm. as friends, and uh, this resulted from a number of reasons, uh, and there are lots of emigrants uh, who came to Ukraine. Well, it's an interesting picture of propaganda as a kind of cover, uh, as a kind of shelter uh, for the regime and uh, for authoritarian uh, uh, regime in Kremlin. And uh, I like for us to, to take a broader look, thanks to Clementina, who deals with uh, well, the most deceptive part of the Russian propaganda, which is the influence of Kremlin through maybe not extremist and right-wing movements, but rather through ideological and worldview movement. Uh, uh, well, Clementina, what does it look like? And uh, what aim does it serve? Well, this is something we are uh, the least aware of when it comes to public debates. And that's also something that I've been dealing with uh, for the past two years. Uh, but it was only, it was also before that I could see this in the streets and uh, as an activist, uh, as a as an activist uh, linked uh, with uh, women's movements, I uh, I was uh, trying to define who am I fighting against. It started with Ordo Iuris, and then I realized after a number of articles I wrote that I do not have the entire picture. I was standing in the street, and I didn't know who I was fighting against, and this pushed me to investigate this matter further on. And right now, it can be said that there are researchers, journalists, uh, or there have been researchers and German journalists uh, in the past year who started to deal with this topic in a range of countries. Uh, there are some journalists dealing with this topic, and uh, we are trying, we are starting to come to very interesting conclusions, mainly what is visible um, uh, that is that, and it is visible very clearly that the associations, groups that we know uh, that uh, fight uh, against women's rights, uh, against uh, human rights, against LGBT movements, well, uh, they build a whole, uh, an entirety. They cooperate with each other. It's not a loose cooperation that we've seen uh, one another uh, some time ago. No, it is close cooperation since 2013. And this is really interesting because when I started to look at this topic, I was a bit lost because I don't know from which side I should approach the topic, uh, how I should put an order to the topic. And it turned out that chronology is key here. That's what Professor mentioned. So it all started around 2013, uh, cash flows uh, from the USA to Europe uh, when it comes to ultra uh, conservative organizations from the US. We call them fundamentalists right now. Uh, so, are the is this money American or is this a Russian uh, money? Because Russians uh, started at that time to pump uh, lots of money uh, into such activities. Uh, 
but the year 2013 was really meaningful because when we started to investigate all the organizations, uh, it all brings this all brings us to 2013. Ordo Iuris was also created in 2013, so they've been active uh, since 2013. Uh, please explain what Ordo Iuris is. Well, uh, 2013 is important because since. Uh, that year, the, the cooperation has been really close and uh, tight, and uh, we've had Agenda Europe, as it is called in uh, media, and the name comes from a manifesto. Uh, and since uh, 2013, there are secret meetings held once a year. It's a group of lobbyists of the main groups, main organizations. Uh, religious uh, fundamentalist organizations and our order Juris, which was established in 2013 as well has been a member of uh, this uh, secret uh, organization since 2015 and they are very efficient they are trying to get into all international organizations institutions to conduct their counter revolution which is linked uh, to reversing uh, rights uh, uh, that have been granted uh, to uh, to uh, as a result of uh, the revolu revolution of 1968, uh, of uh, um, lots of uh, revolutions taking place over the course of the time, uh, because they think that uh, all these rights uh, should be reversed. And we might have the impression they belong to the Middle Age, and they do belong to the Middle Age, and they are open about it. And I know that it seems uh, like impossible, totally unrealistic. I know that, but there are confirmations, there are doc documents of the agenda uh, Europe uh, that have been leaked. Uh, there were lots of leaks uh, from uh, cyber attacks and so on and so forth. We do have access to those documents and the documents uh, say about this very clearly. Oh. Uh, or do you he could explain what all the Euris means. Maybe there are some foreign people who don't know what this organization is, what it stands for. Could you describe the background of this organization? Because it's not just an organization that is rooted in Poland. There is more to it. There is this agenda, Europe, that has a broader perspective that does not cover just Poland. It is linked to different organizations of, of, of which are similar and and exist in other countries. So for those who don't know what Ordo Iuris is, and also what is the relation between Ordo Iuris and the Kremlin, Ordo Iuris is a foundation, and this is like the main cause of all the bad things happening in Poland right now. They wanted to punish women for an abortion in 2016, and this resulted in the so-called black protest. And this is, it is an organization which has been causing many problems ever since. And there were different resolutions adopted at EU level condemnating the Polish government. And this all starts with projects developed by this organization. And they work together with different similar organizations. They create a network. And as regards its collaboration with the Kremlin or the URIS itself, well, it is difficult to find a direct contact between uh, other Yuris and the Kremlin players. However, I am one of those people who understand how this all works. It's not about direct contacts usually. You will have your intermediaries, and all the Euros also have such intermediaries. You have this agenda Europe, and this will be an intermediary between all the Euros and the Kremlin. He is uh, referred to as the ambassador of the World Congress of Families. This is an international organization, and all those movements are members of this Congress, and they come together once a year. They gather. And this was the initiative of a Russian professor who specialized in, in social uh, studies. Uh, well, actually, social studies are exploited by the Kremlin in an interesting way. And there is also an American person involved uh, coming from this ultra-conservative American organization. It was in mid-90s, and it kept developing. And around 2013, 
it started developing faster and faster. And at that time, within the Kremlin itself, there was another um, gathering of, of this World Congress of Families, and all the years is linked to those people. And those people, in turn, um, are related with the Kremlin, Konstantin Malafiev, who supports initiatives such as the coup d'etat in Montenegro and he is covered by sanctions, he cannot enter the EU. Um, and these sanctions against him were introduced after the uh, Russian attack uh, in Ukraine. And there were some Ukrainian hackers who established that he sent money to finance anti-Ukrainian acts, which were performed by our far-right organizations here in Poland, for example. So you can see those links, but it, these are not direct links. These are just the consequences of there being a network. So if I come here today, tomorrow, and I, I, if I, and I can provide a proof of a pay, payment being made for order use from the Kremlin, you can feel that everything has become a conspiracy theory now. There is so much as information that even if you do have a real, true piece of information, people will not believe you anyway, and they will say that this is yet uh, one more example of fake news. Well, it is very really fascinating what you're saying. And we can see the results of that in Poland. We can see the, how this Russian pro propaganda is received in Poland and is perceived in Poland. We have Order Juris, this ultra conservative organization, and we have ultra conservative media and ultra conservative ideologies. We can really feel now they really do exist, they are present, and how Russia depicts the picture of Ukraine, and how Ukraine is perceived by our current government, and how it is treated by our current government. Well, when you see this, it's kind of sad. However, I would like to jump to another issue. Uh, well, it is a fascinating topic, but it's a very broad one, and we do not have so much time. So I would like to ask whether you could tell us what kind of tools might be efficient when it comes to counteracting this um, offensive propaganda of Russia? What would be your recommendations? What could we do as recipients of information provided by this uh, Kremlin propaganda apparatus? What should we do? To, to protect ourselves from that message coming from the Kremlin? What can we do to counteract that message, that propaganda? May I? Well, I'd start with an observation from my own perspective. I can say that even the classical propaganda like Sputnik, this is well known, this is still not as bad as the erosion of the rule of law in Poland or the erosion of good media in Poland, which might not be a result of any activities taken by the Kremlin, but still I believe that you should analyze this Pro, these propaganda schemes to be able to tell where there might be some sort of inspiration in your own country coming from that source. But I think it's much more dangerous what is happening right now in Poland, all those tendencies to apply identical schemes. Well, look at the Polish national TV. This might not have been inspired by the Kremlin, but it's exactly the same thing that is happening in Poland with the state-owned TV as what is happening in Russia with the Russian state-owned uh, TV. So we have not educated our citizens enough, and they cannot protect themselves from that Polish state on TV propaganda nowadays, so you don't even need a foreign agent coming from Russia. 
you will have the Polish government uh, providing exactly the same statement as the elites in the Kremlin. Like, you can hear that Poland is entitled to make its own decisions whether a certain law is or is not applicable in Poland or is or is not in line with international law. Like, they say that the constitution is more important uh, than international uh, law. This does not come from Russia. This is our own product, the product of our own government. And this all results in what is called sovereign democracy in Russia. So this is a model of a quasi-democracy. Um, so you do have a parliament and you do have different uh, controlling institutions, but in fact they are not independent. And in fact this is just fake parliament and fake um, the fake system of checks and balances. And the current situation, what the government is doing right now in Poland, for me, this does not really qualify as what we would call far right. However, sometimes I am really surprised when I see different things the Polish state on TV is doing. This reminds me of many things I've been watching in Russia for so long. And I don't think it was inspired by Russia, but it's just this division of power that, as it turns out, has not been um, rooted deep enough in Poland and is now being questioned by our current government. And we need more education for our citizens for different age groups. N it should not be um, happening just at schools. We need to address other people as well. And if we provide that education for our citizens, they can react when they are confronted with such absurd ideas. Of course, you can also teach people how to analyze information in a better way. And I think this should be taught at schools as well. So how to analyze text in a critical way so that they have more orientation as to how social media work. However, well, you just need to educate your people. You just need to educate your citizens so that they can protect themselves when such absurd ideas are presented by different political um, groupings. So we used to receive like a license from Russia to produce Kalashnikovs and now we receive from Russia a free license for how to question this uh, liberal democracy and, and we seem to like it. Professor, voice over to you. The question you ask, we would need another three or four hours to, uh, <laughs> to discuss it. Um, uh, I understand why you asked the question, but I think it's a very difficult question because you have to put it into the broader context that Russia's biggest export is corruption. It's not gas. Um, and with corruption comes compromat. Um, you know, you have, you can grab politicians. And that's... <laughs> well, every, well, not just you. I mean, London is nicknamed Londongrad or Moskva um, and, and um, you know, um, sadly, in the last 20 years, there's been a growth of this offshoring and this allowing of, of oligarch money, dirty money, to come to the West. And uh, with that money comes compromat. Um, no, uh, Boris Johnson in Britain is refusing to publish the intelligence report because it has information about Russian oligarchs giving money to the Conservative Party. So, you know, this is the Conservative Party which is anti-Russian, anti-Putin. So um, I think it's a very complicated, but I don't think it's such a, I think it's also difficult because you have social media today and how do you stop um, that? I mean, there's only been recent attempts because of the US elections to clamp down on Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube and elsewhere. Um, but um, I think that in my field, academic field, um, you might be surprised to hear that uh, there are academics in the West who are pro-Putin, who are anti-Russia. Yeah, I'm sure they are. I mean, the, the worst one... Sometimes you can uh, listen to them on Russia Today. Tool. Um, but he's a very well-known British academic, you know, expert on Russian politics and everything else, but he just sprouts Putin's propaganda. Um, if you look at his book from, on the war from 2015, it's, it could have been written by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Moscow. Um, so uh, what do I do? I, all the books on the 
Russian-Ukrainian war, I always critically, very critically review them in Western academic journals. So they, but it's a, you're fighting a battle because uh, this kind of conspiracy mindset even goes into academia. Manchester University Press, which is a very prestigious publishing house, just published a book by a Dutch academic saying MH17 was a Western conspiracy. How did the reviewers allow this rubbish to be published? Um, you know, there's a trial beginning in March of next year in The Hague about this. So it's a difficult... I mean, one of the ways um, you can approach this, and I, you do this in academia, we've talked a lot and joked about fascists. Um, the problem is, is that uh, when Russia... Sorry, when the Soviet Union used this term, and when Russia uses it today, it does not use a political science definition of fascism which is the far right, which is now a bit different. It's not just Nazis and fascists, it's also populist nationalists and others, but, but this is what we would understand in political science to be the, the, the far right. But in Soviet propaganda and in current Russian disinformation, a fascist is anybody who did not like the Soviet Union. And so it could be national communist in Ukraine like Ivan Juba, who's also you know, a fascist because he was anti-Soviet. Um, and in today's concept, is any Ukrainian who does not want to join the Russian world. You are a fascist. So Zelensky, <laughs> the Jewish-Ukrainian president who supports EU and NATO membership, is a fascist. Um, so this is not... Uh, well, Zhedo Banderivitz, yes. This is the, the, the very funny term coined by the Jewish-Ukrainian oligarch Igor Kolomoisky, to, to laugh at this Russian propaganda. So that, and he, Kolomoisky has a t-shirt made called I am a Zhedo <laughs> Um So yes, it, it's ridiculous, um, but because it has no connection to academic understanding of the far right. It's just, you know, if you, if you support European integration, if you do not support Eurasian integration, you are a fascist. Well, sadly, this, is spread also in the West, and you have to combat it. You have to do something against it, and we all do it to the best of our abilities. I mean, it's not as bad, I don't think, in some countries. It's worse in some countries because some countries are more better fertile ground for Russian propaganda. So, for example, if you have a, a large anti-Americanism in your country, like France, mm -hmm. then Russia can build on it. Mm -hmm. But in Britain, you can't. I mean, also, you have very strong British media, Um, and after script, I'll forget it. You can... <laughs> Yes, indeed, but they can do this in another way, too. They might look for different spots where they can transfer their propaganda. The Union was already an expert on this, and Putin is building on this. Before the age of fax machines, never mind internet, Before the age of fax machines, ale że wejdę słowo, ale przede wszystkim upadł komunizm. Well, the com communism collapsed, so this ideological isolation is gone now. This limitation, ideological limitation, is gone. The world that the CIA invented AIDS. This was before the age of fax machines and internet, and and you know, so they are they are experts, and Putin is building on this tradition. He didn't invent hybrid war or disinformation. He's just building on this. And for 60 years, they denied the existence of the famine in Ukraine. They, they also disinformation campaign against this. So they, they are experts on this. And um, I think it's, the West has just woken up to this. So it's, it takes time. But there, there's many good things happening. In Ukraine, you have this great website since the Euro 2014 called Stop Fake. Um, you have this European Union disinformation uh, review. So there are things happening. Not, not everything is lost. <laughs> God, thanks, thanks God that not everything's lost. Clementina, from my backyard, uh, from my experience as a journalist, uh, as a writer, what we definitely need to do, well, 
we need to have knowledge coming from experts on what's going on. This knowledge, this expertise needs to be passed on, and this requires uh, the participation of the media. Uh, but in order to write about it, we need money because we need some projects. But I would like to make you sensitive to the following thing. We should also, well, when it comes to researchers who um, who approach uh, some new topics, uh, well, I think they should have certain freedom when it comes to what topics to choose because that's really important in the work of journalists. Sometimes it's really difficult to env envisage uh, within a project uh, what exactly this project will be about and I would like to give some freedom to, to people who would like to search for answers, who would not like to define the problem um, at the very beginning, but this requires uh, funds, uh, especially for investigative uh, journalism, uh, for following uh, fake news. What we also need is international cooperation because certain trends uh, happen all over the world, are used not only in Europe, but also in Latin America. There are lots of interesting and uh, important things for us in Latin America. And when I have a look at uh, the situation, I have the impression that the only healthy tissue that is reacting to, well, uh, like when we are ill, that is reacting immediately and gets rid of uh, disinformation, but on the other hand, the only tissue which has strength uh, to make the, or the body healthy again, these are grassroots movements, especially women's movements all over the world. So those women's movements are the only healthy tissue in uh, the ill body. Uh, and uh, so what I mean here are LGBT movements as well dealing with various topics all over the world, uh, for instance, in India, but also climate affairs. And I think we should invest in those movements because in the long run we need education, but in the short run, in order to tackle the problems and have a breakthrough, we require researchers, uh, we need uh, activists in the streets who will try to counteract uh, the situation. And I think that uh, women's movements are really powerful not only because I'm active as a, uh, as a member of such a group, I think that's the only uh, credible, reliable source of strength that brings something new. And uh, I'm not talking about feminists only. We were talking about democracy, sovereign democracy. But there is a term coined, uh, a new new term of a radical democracy, democracy which is radical once and for all, uh, not a democracy that is uh, that elects every four years uh, someone who will represent uh, the, the society, but a democracy that is given once and for all. I would like to add uh, from myself that still in Poland we need awareness, uh, uh, especially among elites, uh, also our, my journalist elites, uh, the awareness of of uh, the threats around us and political awareness, because I think that the awareness is missing. We treat threats uh, from Russia as a threat which does not concern us uh, for some reason, uh, because uh, Poland is uh, has been impregnated and is safe and cannot be affected by the threat uh, coming from Russia. Poland is uh, so much anti-Russia, uh, anti-Russian, that it cannot be affected by the threat coming from Russia. And this is what our friends from Ukraine are saying. Uh, we cannot uh, remain silent. That's not true that uh, we are unaffected by what's going on in uh, Russia. Russian people know how to deal with Poles. And paradoxically, I'd like to say that uh, Poland uh, is needed by Russia as uh, someone who is used uh, to uh, to be depicted in Europe as a group of those who are not friendly towards Russia, who uh, who are hostile even, who should not be looked at, uh, who are anti-Russian to a very high extent and who have certain phobias concerning Russia. So I think we should be aware of uh, the threat. We should pay attention to the threat and this will contribute to a large ex uh, extent to the success. Well, uh, uh, we are tight on, uh, on uh, time. So I'd like to 
thank our panelists for their contribution. I'd like to invite you to the next panel. We have no time to open a discussion. Unfortunately, Kristina Kurchav Predlich, well, I'll hand over the mic to you. Well, uh, we have no time, so I won't get into detail, but uh, I'm frustrated a bit because we behave as if we were we lived uh, on a planet which has no information, no television. Since 2002, well, when I'm sorry for talking about myself, I wrote an article about uh, democracy, and in this article uh, I wrote uh, that uh, there will be an end point, uh, put to this story of Putin and uh, since that time I'm treated as anti-Putin and my uh, colleagues journalists uh, said well they treated me like uh, a fanatic uh, who is uh, so much against Putin but they had to admit I was right so the truth is uh, well I I'm I've come back from Georgia a couple of uh, days ago and there are lots of things, interesting things going on in Georgia as well and I think we should also think about uh, what's going on there. Uh, we should think about your book and the books uh, by Tomasz Piątek who black and white show what's going on in Poland. Why uh, Russia is being treated, uh, is being marginalized. Uh, do you remember can you quote, um, do you remember a program about Russia? Do we know something about uh, Russian opposition? We don't know what the opposition looks like. We think it does not exist, but we don't realize that it cannot exist if uh, it doesn't get media coverage. Some people claim there is no opposition in Russia, which is not true, and the same applies to Ukraine. Just a sec. Unfortunately, I can't uh, hear what's being uh, said. Uh, not into the mic. Well, so. The situation is different when it comes to TV. TV gives us some impulse, some signal that we need to deal with something. And you were talking about things which are obvious to us because we deal with Russia on everyday basis. But uh, for uh, people who are not interested in Russia, well, they do not realize that there is an opposition in Russia. This problem is marginalized, and that's because of what our media say, books on Macerevich, books on our great prime minister. Well. They are not mentioned, uh, but that's not because of her, of their value. Uh, well, that's not Tokarczuk, uh, but the reality is that we are living in really difficult and horrible uh, times. What you said about Ordo Iuris, I think this should be um, covered by Onet and other. Uh, media. What's the reason? The reason is fear. Fear to uh, meddle in uh, affairs that are really important. We only care about uh, bubbles uh, on the surface, uh, but uh, we are not interested in what's going on beneath. Uh, that's something that's not uh, mentioned by journalists, but this requ would require to have some knowledge. And it seems it's too much to be um, forced to read a couple of books. Uh, when it comes to journalists. We do not talk about um, cyber attacks, about the network in Russia uh, that's active on the Internet. And the uh, realities we live in are really horrible. And I think that uh, the media are to blame. When I was a journalist in uh, Russia, I cooperated with Polsat uh, uh, TV station. And I asked Polsat, please give me an opportunity to show to people what was going on in Russia. And Polsat said, well, people are not interested in what's going on 
uh, in Russia. And it's stunning that some might claim that uh, uh, it's not interesting for people to see what's going on in the neighboring countries. It's a vicious circle of ignorance. I'm really sorry, but we are all to blame and our colleagues, journalists are also to blame. <laughs> inaudible because of not using the mic. Well, I'm not talking about Gazeta Vyborcza, who has a restricted number of recipients uh, and audience, while well, the readers of Gazeta Vyborcza are present in the room. I'm talking about uh, TV stations and uh, uh, reaching important matters through TV. Thank you. Thank you, Kristina. Once again, thank you. Let me just subscribe to what uh, Kristina Kurczapredlich just said. If you ask yourselves uh, the question why this is the case, I think that a lot depends on, on us, really. I just wanted to say, well, inaudible. Well, we'll continue at lunch. Yes, that that. Yes, certainly. Thank you.